you, Mark. Let's uh, pray together. Bow your heads with me a moment. The theme we're gonna talk about today is discouragement and uh, how really ultimately we, we can be, should be, need to be encouraged in the work of God. And some of you may have some uh, discouragement in your life, some uh, what we might call spiritual exhaustion, weariness and well-doing, and maybe these nagging thoughts. Is it really worth it? And uh, why don't we pray together today? Pray that God will encourage you in his work, encourage you about uh, serving God, being committed to God with your life, and to speak to your heart today. Father, we, we come because we need encouragement. We get it from you. We get it from the Spirit of God, who is the great comforter and the great encourager. And we also get it from the people of God, from being with brothers and sisters, people that walk the same journey, that share the same passion, they're committed to the same cause. I pray that we would leave here in what is clearly a rainy and gloomy day with the joy of Jesus flooding our hearts because serving you is worth it. Worshiping you is what you are worthy of. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Really glad you're here today. Let's just jump right into this today. Uh, they're going to put a screen up on the on the um, the video board. Tommy showed this to me. I don't normally deal with things I'm not seeing and processed. This is in my short term memory, not my long term memory. But it's such a it's such an interesting picture. Lisa and I have been in Jerusalem. Really want to go back. It, it is life changing to see it. It's very helpful to get this from a a kind of an aerial view. Now this is. This is several iterations of the old city of Jerusalem. If you go to there today, it's actually, it, even the, what, what they call the old city is a little bit more in rectangular form than this. But this wall is what Nehemiah was building while Ezra was building and rebuilding the temple which sits on Temple Mount. Let me tell you a little bit about the wall so that you get an idea. Of the, of the magnitude of what uh, the children of Israel, what, what Nehemiah was leading the people to do. That wall there that uh, you're looking at is each, of, each element of that wall is 39 feet high. It is two and a half, or I'm sorry, it's, it's 8.2 feet thick and it's two and a half miles long. They built from gate to gate, so the gate plus the wall to the next gate. That is what they were doing. And what, what is actually remarkable, we'll get to this next week in a little bit more of a highlight form, but they did it in 52 days. Just a little less than two months, right? And we've talked about the significance of that work, right? Rebuilding the wall, the city of Jerusalem is the city of God, and the city of God is to bring joy to the whole earth. So the city broken down was not fulfilling its, its mission. It was not fulfilling its intended role. And so Nehemiah comes back to build uh, the work of God. Let me, let me try to put this in, in maybe a little personal perspective for you to get started. <clears throat> Your journey is not necessarily my journey. Some things that happen to me obviously are part of the fact that I'm I'm the pastor, and so some of what I have to deal with is kind of like what we all have to deal with. And I am not typically the kind of person, like I don't get up and think, oh man, I'm discouraged today. Now I do and have had experiences in my life where I am like, man, I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm really struggling with this, or this is really difficult. The way, the way I'd probably describe it to you is this. I've had a few experiences in my life where I, I had this fear kind of grip me, and the fear was rooted in this idea that I really don't know what I'm doing. Now, you think, well, that's not a big deal. Well, it's not when it doesn't affect anybody else, but when it has impact on everybody else, you're like, that is a big deal. <clears throat> when I First started pastoring, I'll just tell you just a quick little story. I 
we, we had been meeting in the gymnasium, which is the building to, to my right, your left, and the church had started meeting there in September of, 1990, uh, September of 1972. When I became pastor in December of 92, we talked, I talked with the leadership of the church, primarily worked with a, a finance committee. Uh, a lot of those men are, have gone on to be with the Lord now. Some of them are still here, had conversations with a few of them this morning. We've reminisced about this. But I, I talked with them and I said, hey, we had already developed these plans to build an auditorium, which was actually out, was gonna be out by the pond over here to the left. And in the plans to build that auditorium, it, it, the, the plans had come back too expensive and the conclusion was that the building was too large to build. But the problem was we owed the contractor, the, the construction company that was helping us do the, the design work and the engineering, we owed them $535,000. And so we were caught in this dilemma. We either build a building we can't afford to save our $535,000 or we, we pay the $535,000 and get out of this contract and then re start over from scratch. And literally, when I tell you I did not know what I was doing, I did not know what I was doing, I convinced those men, that, and, and not against their will, but I convinced them, hey, we've been planning this for two and a half years. We really aren't any closer than we were when we started. Maybe this is what we should do. Maybe this, we shouldn't do this. We should do something different. And surprisingly, they all agreed. And so I took two of the men, <clears throat> one still living, <clears throat> and he's in his 80s. His health is not great, but he, he was here last week. He's here most every week. And the other has gone on to be with the Lord. And I took the two men, and we went to meet with this, the, the owner of the construction company, and I had in my pocket a $535,000 check. Now, I don't normally walk around with that kind of money, or I didn't then, I do now. I kind of carry that kind of cash. But then, it, that was a lot of money, right? I mean, that was a lot of money. Say that, lot of money. Is that a lot of money to you? And <clears throat> I sat down with the, the, these guys, the two deacons that were with me, and he had two project manager and vice president of the company and him and the owner of the company. And we were talking and it was a little small talk. And I finally said to him, I said, Mr. Glass, let me tell you really why I'm here. I said, we just, there's just no way we're going to be able to build this building. And I said, we got a problem. He goes, well, what's the problem? I said, we owe you money. And his guy that was running the project, he looked over and he said, well, how much do they owe us? And the guy said, $535,000. So I said, Mr. Glass, we're gonna pay you the money because we believe it's the right thing to do and we're gonna start over. He goes, let me get this straight. You're gonna give me $535,000 that you're not ever gonna use. You're gonna pay me that money and then you're gonna completely start over the project. He goes, that's like throwing $535,000 in the um, trash can. I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't call your company a trash can, but I didn't say that. I'm thinking, and, and I said, the only thing I said to him, is, I said, well, our testimony matters to us. We don't think this is your mistake. We think it's probably our, there's a lot of reasons why we, and, and so I took the check and I slid it across the table. We were in this, Tommy, I'll never forget this. We were in this large conference room and I thought that if I slid the check, it would kind of go all the way to the end of the table. This conference table was so large, it only went halfway across the table. And it's just sitting there in no man's land, right? And I'm like, should, should I blow on it or, you know, what? So his guy, one of his guys gets up and he, he takes a check and he gives it to the owner of the company. And the guy's looking at me and he's got this look of disbelief on his face. And he says to me, can you give me a minute? And I'm like, you're important. You own a big company, a multi-million dollar company. We're just trying to build a little church building. Sure, do whatever you need to do. And he takes his two guys and they get up and they go out of the room and I'm sitting there with our two guys and I'm thinking, man, we just gave him $535,000. We're never gonna get that money back. And I, I, I'm thinking this is, we are, I'm, I'm thinking I am way in over my head. I, I always think, I'm gonna, I, I, I had this, I'm gonna have to go home and tell Lisa, Honey, we're not going to make this very long. I have no clue about what I'm doing. And the guy comes back in. 
He sits down, he goes, in all the years I've been doing this, nobody has ever offered to pay us money for something that they weren't gonna get value from. He said, it's just beyond me. And he takes a check and he slides it back across the table and it's in no man's land again. And he says, I'm gonna give you your money back. He said, I don't want your money. He said, the only thing I want is a chance to be able to help you build that building. If I can build the building you wanna build at the price you wanna build it, he said, I want you to give me, let me have the contract. I'm like, we get to keep the $535,000? He goes, yeah. And so I took the money, right? <clears throat> took the check. And by the way, we hired them. They built this building. They did it, designed it, and built it in less than 20 months. And you know, it needs some work now. We've been in it for 30 years this, this September. We've been in it 30 years. It costs us $4.1 million. I, I know a lot of facts about things, right? It costs us $4.1 million. They gave us $535,000 back towards that, what, what, it, what we put towards building this building. We got done building this building. We were, we were I mean, months, um, less than a month of getting in. And the city of Jacksonville <clears throat> sent me this, they, they sent me this letter, this formal letter, and they said, <clears throat> we are going to file imminent domain on your rescue mission property, which at that time was on 901 West Bay Street. I know this is a, you didn't come to hear this story, but it will help you to get connected to what I'm going to teach in a minute. And they said, we're going to file eminent domain. I did not know what eminent domain meant. I, I had heard the word, words, but I didn't know what it meant. So I looked it up. And by the way, I didn't look it up on the internet. I looked it up in a dictionary. Because we didn't have the internet, okay? I mean, this is, this is in the dark ages. And the, I, said to, I said to those guys, those same guys on that finance meeting, I said, I think we're gonna have to hire an attorney. And they apparently had a lot of confidence in me because they said, well, you just do whatever you think we need to do. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. And I learned really quick and I ended up in front of a judge and, and the city said to us, we're going to give you $265,000 for your building. And when he said that, I'm like, that's nothing. I didn't say this, but I'm thinking, I just gave a guy $535,000 and you're trying to give us $265,000 is nothing. So the judge says to me in this hearing, he goes, well, pastor, how much do you need? Can I tell you something? I had no idea how much we needed. I looked at him as if I knew everything about what we were doing. I said, we can't do this without a million dollars cash. I say, how do you know? I didn't, I had no clue. I just, this only number that came to my mind. It just seemed like, it seemed like a lot more than $265,000, right? And the city people got upset with me and they said, you can't do that. I said, how come? They said, well, you, you, the building you have is not worth $265,000. I said, look, I said, here, and you know, you talk about God, I can tell you, this is a whole nother lesson, but so I said, well, let me explain this to you. I said, we're driving a 1970 Chevy, and we're happy with our 1970 Chevy. It, we, it's paid for, it doesn't need a lot of work, it, it's utilitarian, it does everything that we need to do. And I said, when we go to buy a new building, you're gonna want us to build it into, at that time, that was like 1994, 95 codes. I said, it's gonna be like buying a brand new Cadillac. And you're giving us money for a 70 Chevy, but you want us to build a, a 1995 Cadillac. And the judge said, he looked over the city, he goes, he's got a point. I'm like, okay, I got a point. That's, I'm like, that's really good, right? And <clears throat> long story short, I can tell you, it's a fascinating story. The mayor, who I developed a relationship with, we kept going back and forth negotiating, and he, his, his office called me one Friday and said, hey, <clears throat> mayor wants to come to church on Sunday. He doesn't want to say anything. He doesn't want to be recognized. 
He just wants to come and worship. And God was working his life. It's a, it's a whole nother story. And he, did, he came and he sat, he sat in, the, in the back, in that back section right there. He was here on a Sunday morning. And <clears throat> he did not know this, and it was not planned. But we probably had about 100, maybe 120 homeless people in, in the service that day. And they were running just a little bit late, and they came walking in, and they literally filled this section of the auditorium from the very front all the way to the back. And he thought I did that to make him feel bad about what they were doing to us. I did. I was, it was a normal thing for us. And he had his chief of staff <clears throat> send me a note. He came up and saw me. I said, we're, we're Lisa. And he said, can the mayor say something? I'm like, we don't normally do that in church, but he is the mayor. And this guy. So I said, sure. So he came up, introduced him. He got up in the pulpit, and he got emotionally choked up. And all he could get out was, we're not handling this correctly. We're going to help you. I promise you we're going to make this thing right. And, and, and that week, in my office, I negotiated with the, the, the chief of staff of the mayor's office, and we agreed to, this, this is the, to show you the detail of the deal, we agreed that they would give us $875,000 for that building, and they gave us two years so we could invest the money and we could earn interest on the money for two years, which got us to the million dollars, and they gave us the land where our, where our current mission is. And I'm like, okay, this is, I still don't know what I'm doing, but it's working. I was in a meeting, this gets better. We had signed the papers, we had had the building designed for the, the rescue mission facility, and I was sitting in my office and there were seven men, the ones that are still living are in our church, the ones that aren't obviously are in our cemetery, so they're either here or there, right, but they're here. And one of them said to me, just, just, not, he just was, it was kind of like this, man, all this stuff is really happening. It's just going, he said to me, he goes, hey, pastor, what's next? I'm like, get up every day, go to work, and, and, and hope people don't find out that I don't know what I'm doing. That's what I'm thinking, right? He says, what's next? And I said, and I don't even know why I said this. I have no idea. I said, let's sell the college facility, which was on McDuff Avenue, and let's move the college out to McDuff, I mean, from McDuff out to Hammond. They goes, yeah, let's do that. I'm like, are you kidding me? And so one of them said, well, let's do this. Let's put it up for sale for 90 days. And if we, if we get an offer that we like in 90 days, let's sell that piece of property. And <clears throat> he said, we'll, we'll have one guy contact 100 businesses in 90 days. That's one phone call a day, a couple days you had to do more than one phone call. We'll contact 100 businesses and if nobody wants the facility, we'll figure out how to make it work there. Then we all agreed to it, just, just that quick. We didn't talk to anybody else. We just, the, the eight of us had that conversation, agreed to do that, and that was the plan. On the 89th day, we got a contract offer. The contract offer was $230,000. And those guys were in my office. There was four of them. And, and we, were, we were sitting in, in, in my office on, on, on couches, not, not behind my desk. We were just having a very casual conversation. And they said to me, four of them were looking at me, and they said to me, what should we do? We've got this contract offer. What should we do? And I said, well... We probably should take it because we may not ever get any more than that for the facility. And they said, yeah, you're right. But they said, we can counter. And so they said, what do you think we should counter for? I, I'm, I'm not a, I don't know. I said a million dollars. <laughs> Mac Hebner, who's, who's the president of the college now, <clears throat> I was thinking about this this morning early all those guys were in their 50s at the time. I was in my 30s. Um, he said, I'm going to send them a contract. I'm going to fax them a counteroffer for a million dollars. And we put some 
terms in there, you know, we would get 24 months. This is all, all these terms, right? And I mean, on the 90th day at 11 o'clock, and we told them they had to respond to us by noon, at 11 o'clock in the morning, they faxed us back a signed contract. Now, <clears throat> I, I want you to understand this. I still had, I, the, the thing that nagged me more than anything else was I'm like, the, these people keep every, every harebrained idea I have, they, they keep saying, okay. I'm like, I, I mean, I really, in fact, I have that thought every once in a while. I don't know what I'm doing, but I really had that thought. I was, <clears throat> I was driving in my car, just coming back from, I was out, I made a visit out to the, to the north here. I was driving back, <clears throat> and an attorney, in our, who was in our church at the time, he's since gone on to be with the Lord. He's, he, was a, he was a godly man, just a great, great man. He, he called me on the phone. He said, he, and I had known him since I'd come here. He always called me coach. Even to the day he died, he never called me anything but coach. He said, hey coach, what are you doing? I said, I'm riding in my car. He goes, the Lord told me to call you and encourage you because he thinks and I think you're discouraged. And I thought to myself that nothing in the world was any more true than that, what he said to me. And I won't tell you the whole thing. Another day I'll tell you the rest of the story. And God used that in my life to convince me it didn't really matter if I knew what I was doing or not. Right? It matters whether he knows what he's doing or not. When you come to the book of Nehemiah, <clears throat> There comes this point in Nehemiah chapter four where the people become really discouraged over the work. Lindsay read some of these verses to you. If you look down at verse 10 and 11, Judah said the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. In other words, they've gotten weary in the work and there's so much rubbish so that we're not able to build the wall. The work is getting really hard. Verse 11, and our adversaries. Then if you come down to verse 14, and I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your houses. Gordon MacDonald said this. <clears throat> he said, a man is discouraged when his obstacles are bigger than his God. The reason that these people were discouraged their obstacles, the work they were doing, appeared bigger to them than their God. Let's talk about how do you persevere through discouragement very quickly. First of all, let's talk about the source of discouragement. Now, <clears throat> what, what I want you to see here is that discouragement, and, and by the way, ask yourself this question. I want you to think about this for a moment. Have you ever had this thought, is it really worth it for me to serve God with my life? And, and specifically, is it worth it for me to get up every Sunday, get my family ready, go to church, not just sit at church, but serve at church? Is it worth it for me to make a commitment when sometimes I feel like I'm giving more than I'm getting out of it? Sometimes I feel like I'm doing all this and I really wonder what kind of progress that I'm making or what good is this accomplishing? We all struggle with those kind of doubts. We all struggle with those kind of, of thoughts in our life, right? And, and by the way, you, you never do something great for God in a day. You never do something great for God in a week or in a month or in a year. You do it over time. It takes decades and lifetimes before you ever really see the great progress in the work of God. So discouragement comes from two places. First of all, it comes from external opposition. Now, <clears throat> there's three layers to this. Discouragement op from, from the outside comes when the people start just, they, they start disparaging the workers in the work and they keep saying bad things about Nehemiah. And what Nehemiah does when people say bad things about him, I want you to get this, he prays. Your first recourse every time you start to feel discouragement is start praying. 
And by the way, don't pray about it one time, don't pray about it two times. I mean, you gotta constantly barrage the throne of God with your prayers when you get discouraged. And everybody gets discouraged, and the antidote to discouragement is prayer. But then, not only do they taunt Nehemiah with their words, they begin to uh, connive and make plans against them, and they begin to organize so that they can be subversive, so that they can stop the building of the wall. So Nehemiah responds, and guess what he does in this second layer of opposition? He prays. By the way, do you know that the Bible says this? Men ought always to pray and not to faint. That word not to faint means not to lose heart, not to become discouraged. When you get discouraged, the antidote to discouragement is prayer. Men ought always to pray. Men ought to keep praying so they do not get discouraged. And so he tells the people to pray, and then he takes a number of the workers and he turns them into watchmen. So now he's got some people building the wall, and he's got some people acting as armed guards that are protecting the people that are doing the work. Then the opposition intensifies. You actually begin to see this as you come down further, and they now not just are threatening the people, but they are organizing themselves to go to war. And so what Nehemiah does now is he gives every one of the workers a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other hand. So they are building with one hand and battling with the other hand. Let me tell you something. Inter external opposition is always a threat to the work of God. I, I, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the most unusual thing. And by the way, it's a spiritual opposition that comes. Even the good that the church is trying to do, those that hate God, so hate the work of God, they'll do anything they can to try to stop it. So discouragement comes from external opposition, but it also comes from in, internal challenges. Look, look at <clears throat> verse Number 10, I love the way that this wording is used. And, and Judah said, the strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we're not able to build the wall. Literally, this is what they're saying. There is so much rubbish here. We can't possibly get this done. You know the one thing about ministry that's true? You never run out of broken people. You never run out of problems to solve. You never run out of spiritual warfare that you have to fight. Just think about, and by the way, it wasn't just there was so much work. By the time you come to chapter five, there were economic challenges. The people were really feeling the pressure and the weight of how the finances were working. About it. And so there was this external opposition, internal opposition. Quick, quick, quick little illustration. I want you to get this. If you parallel this with the book of Acts, and, and we're not wall building in the sense that we're building a physical wall. Like we're not asking you, I mean you can do this, we're not asking you to come and paint a building, we're not asking you to come and clean out a flower bed, we're not asking you to come and help us sweep, sweep a sidewalk or clean a room, that, that's not what we're asking you to do. We're asking you to do spiritual work. Now we could ask you to do those things and those would be valid to do, right? But it's the spiritual work of God that we're engaged in. And, and if you look at the book of Acts and you correlate it, the book of Acts has, is, is, is the, it's the birth and, and the growth of the early church, right? And you have these, these incredibly high moments. Day of Pentecost, 3,000 people come to Christ. In Acts chapter four, 5,000 people come to Christ. If, if you come to Acts chapter eight, you have this, this explosion of the gospel into the villages of Samaria. You come to Acts chapter 13, and the cities in Asia Minor are beginning to be really impacted and evangelized, and churches are being planted. And if you just take the high points of the book of Acts, you say, man, the gospel's increasing, the word of God is spreading, disciples are being multiplied, churches are being planted, and man, this thing is just really, really changing the world. So much so that by Acts 17 and verse six, here's what they say about the church. These that have turned the world upside down have come here also. Now, if you only look at the book of Acts and study the high points, you miss the low points. And the low points are they're getting beaten and imprisoned. And there's people internally that are living in hypocrisy and are 
smote for dead in the middle of a church service, Ananias and Sapphira. And there's an argument and a dissension that raises between the care of the widow of the Grecians and the care of the widows of the Hebrews. And a prominent leader in the church is stoned. And another one is killed. He's thrown down from the walls, right? And what you have is you have, for every high moment in church life, you have a challenging moment in church life. Listen, you better prepare for this. Discouragement is going to come in a multitude of ways, and God is saying, hey, it is worth it to serve God. That's the source of discouragement. Secondly, the signs of discouragement. Now, there's two primary symptoms. Here's how you know. In fact, you can take inventory in your own life. When discouragement sets in, it really requires you to persevere. And that's really the word that we're, we're picking on today, we're, we're using today to, to kind of challenge us to thought. Bear Bryant, you know who Bear Bryant was? He coached football at the University of Alabama. He, he wrote part of the Bible. Not, not really. Bear Bryant said this, tough times don't last, tough people do. That ought to be in the Bible. Tough times don't last, tough people do. Actually, Solomon said it this way, a just man falls seven times and rises up again. What makes him just is not whether he falls or not. What makes him just is that he keeps getting up, right? That he is committed to what he is doing. Here are the two signs that you are discouraged. Here's the two things that are true in every discouraged person's life. First of all, fatigue is a sign of discouragement. When the Bible says in, in verse number 10, the strength of the bearers of burden is decayed, it's literally this. These people were physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. They were struggling with the work that they were trying to do. Let me tell you, Paul said to the church at Galatia, let us not be weary in well-doing, right? Let us not be weary in our fatigue for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Your breakthrough, your spiritual progress, those high moments in your life, are at the other side of the fatigue and the tiredness and the weariness that you're experiencing. That's a sign of discouragement. Here's the second sign of discouragement. It's fear, right? And in verse number 14, he says to the people, be not, be not ye afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. You, you gotta think about this for a moment. The single greatest command of all in the Bible is for the people of God not to fear. Fatigue and fear are a deadly cocktail that always lead to frustration and failure. The very thing that's keeping you from moving forward in the work of God, from deepening your commitment, from seeing a breakthrough for, for what God wants to try to do in your life, what God is, is setting out to accomplish in your life, is you will get weary, that's fatigue, and you'll become fearful. You'll think there's just absolutely no way I can do this. Real quick. If you said to me, what are some of the, the best illustrations of, of wall building in contemporary culture? And by contemporary culture, I mean in, in modern in, 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 in the modern church life over the last several hundred years. Probably the abolition of slavery would be at the very top of the list. It's, it's amazing when you think about the abolition of slavery. It did not happen in America until 1865, actually in 63, um, uh, Abraham Lincoln um, had the Emancipation Proclamation. But in... In 1833, Great Britain and all of its colonies um, abolished slavery. Now, the way that that happened, you'd have to almost understand the whole sequence of it. You'd have to back all the way up into the 1770s, and this young British parliamentarian, a politician, it'd be the equivalent of a, 
of a United States senator. His name was William Wilberforce. Wilberforce, if you ever, there, there's several good biographies about his life. Eric Metaxas wrote one. John Piper wrote one. Wilberforce um, was, was personally close with John Newton, and he had a personal relationship with, with John Wesley. Wilberforce, what, what's probably the most, the most outstanding thing about Wilberforce's abolition of slavery is, is you think about over almost a million people died in the United States to abolish slavery. In Great Britain, it was abolished without any, um, any bloodshed at all. It was actually done politically, legislatively. In 1791, so think Wilberforce served from I think 1787 to, seven, uh, to 1826, if, I, if, if my memory is right, and then seven years after he got out of uh, serving in the parliament, um, they passed the law, he was there, they passed the law that abolished slavery. John Wesley wrote <coughs> to um, Wilberforce, he said, unless the divine power has raised you up to be as Athanasius against the world, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing the villainy, which is the scandal of religion, of England, and of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them stronger than God? Be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might till even American slavery shall vanish away before this. Now here, here's, what, here's what Wilberforce did. He literally took on the most evil enterprise in the entire world. And in the most discouraging moments, God used people to encourage him. And he literally changed the world in his lifetime. And you can do it too. It's worth it to serve God. Here's the last thing, very quickly, solutions. How, how, do, you, how do you get past this? There's two things. I'll, I'll show it to you in verse 14. So Nehemiah comes, and by, and by the way, let me, let me say this to you. You do not fight new problems with old methods. You have to keep adjusting. The one constant is prayer, but then he keeps adjusting his practices until finally he's got the whole army, right? And they're, they're armed with swords and trowels. And he says to them, hey, you're losing heart. You're being fearful. Let me tell you two things that'll help you get past the great discouragement that you have in your life. It's not unlike what Joshua says, have I not commanded thee, Joshua 1, I am be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Two things, remember the Lord. See, if, if what McDonald said I quoted to you earlier is true, people that are discouraged, their problems are bigger than their God. The way that you conquer your fear and you overcome your discouragement is remembering that the Lord is great and awesome. He literally, you, you literally bring your fears under control when you remember that God is bigger than your enemies. Psalm 56 Verse 11, in God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. Martin Luther, <clears throat> I, I love reading Martin Luther. He, he and his wife had a, had, a, had a really wonderful relationship. And they were, they were both godly and they, they both spoke truth to the other. Martin Luther famously would go through great times of discouragement and depression. And he'd been so depressed over a long period of time that one day his wife, <clears throat> whose name was Katie, she came downstairs in their house and she was wearing all black, like what she would wear at a funeral. And Martin Luther looked up at her and he said, Katie, who died? And she said, God has. And he said, God has not died. And she said, well, live like it then and act like he's still alive. Do you get that? We live like God is not great and terrible. We live as though God's not bigger than our problems. The very thing that is plaguing you and discouraging you, God is bigger than. And then secondly, <clears throat> fight for your family. 
If, if I could say anything to the 20 year olds and the 30 year olds and the 40 year olds in our church, I would say this. I, I, this probably needs to be said to the 50 year olds, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of 50 year olds that have done this for a long period of time and they're not, they're not showing any signs of giving up. I, I told Tommy today, nothing would, would change what we're doing as a church. There's a number of things, but one thing that would change drastically is if people would just attend more regularly than they're attending. If you, if you come once a month, come twice a month. If you come twice a month, come three times a month. If you come three times a month, just go ahead and get all the way in and come four times a month, right? Just, just get totally committed. You say, why do you do that? Well, look what he says. He said, fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, fight for your houses. Do, do you know why you get involved in a church? You commit yourself to the work of God. You, you don't do it because every week is a big victory. You don't do it because every week is a lot of fun. You don't do it because every week you see incredible progress. You do it because over a lifetime, you're saying to your kids and to your family and to the people that you love and the people that you care for, here's the way, let's walk in this. And someday, they're gonna have something that they can build their lives on because you have been faithful to build your life. Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his famous graduation speech at Harvard in 1978, said, and Solzhenitsyn was banished from Russia. He actually lived in Vermont for a number of years. He said, a decline in courage is the most striking feature of the spiritual exhaustion of the West. It's a very interesting term, spiritual exhaustion. It's the weariness that has happened in American religion where people are just going through the motion. I was preaching this week at, at Word of Life and doing a week-long conference. I was telling Lisa yesterday, I, I told a story, and when you're preaching in conferences, it's a little different. It's like, you know, here, there's a clock there, there's a clock there, there's a clock there, there's a clock there. They're, they're, they're thinking of these little signs that tell me, I'm five minutes overtime. I don't really pay attention to it, but that's what they're telling me, right? When you're preaching conferences, you got a lot, you, you, it's, it's just more time. You can, you can tell stories. You, you can just be more expansive. And so I, was, I told the story. It's a really great little story. I've told it here before. But in setting up that story, I told about how I came across the story, who, who wrote about it originally. And the book, I told a little bit about the book where I'd read the story. And it seemed kind of, it, it, it helped kind of make the story come across, I think, a little bit better. So I, I get done with that sermon, and this, this older couple, not real old, I mean, they were like in their early 90s, kind of a young couple, and they, they came up to me, and they said, hey, can we talk to you? I said, sure. And so they said, you, you were telling about, and they mentioned the guy's name, it's Edmund Clowney. They said, uh, did you know him personally? I said, no, I, I never had the privilege of meeting him. I said, I know a lot about him. I said, all of his books, I've read all of them. I said, he's had a profound impact on my life. And so his, the, the husband says to me, he said, well, pastor, do you know that uh, he, he said, let me tell you this story. He said, you'll find this interesting. He said, he wrote that book after he retired from seminary. I said, yeah, I was familiar. I'm familiar with that. I kind of know the history of it. And he said, well, he came to the town that we were living in. And he said, the little church that we were members at gave him an office and they hired him a secretary and she did all of his typing manuscript work for him and helped him to do all of his research and validate all of his footnotes and, and make sure that the publisher had everything that they needed. And I said, oh, that's just a fascinating story. I said, so, so, I said, so you've met him? And he goes, well, yeah, actually my wife was his secretary that typed the book. I said, it's a great story, right? And now if you're not interested in that kind of thing, it, was, it, 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 was a, it blessed me. I'm like, okay, man, what a, what a, and we stood there and talked for five or six minutes about this writer that, and, and, and how gifted he was and some of the books that, that he had written and some of the manuscripts she had worked on. And we went through this whole long conversation and, and we were, you know, the conversation was coming to an end and, and then his wife says to me, hey, can I tell you one more thing? And they said it in a way like, hey, we've already taken a lot of your time. It's an imposition. You know, I don't want to take more time. And I said, sure, tell me whatever you want to. I'm like, I'm not doing anything else. I mean, I've got to be here the whole week, you know, to tell me, whatever you want to tell me. And she goes, my daughter-in-law listens to you every week. 
And she found out that you were here this week and that we were going to be here when you were here. And she said that she wanted me to tell you a story. I said, sure. She goes, she said that when she was a little girl, she came to your church and that's where she first heard about Jesus and that's where she got saved and she got baptized and she began to follow the Lord. Now I'm telling you, if that first story hadn't been an encouragement to me, that second story was a 10 times, 10,000 times greater encouragement. You never know what God's going to do when you stay faithful to the work of God. Remember this, Jesus, the true and better Nehemiah, he just didn't risk his life to build a city. He risked his life and gave up his life so that you and I could become citizens of the eternal city of God. And that's all the encouragement you need, right? That's all that you need to hold on to, to say, I am going to be faithful. I'm going to be unmovable. I'm going to be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let's stand together. Father, speak to our hearts. Lord, for those that are weary in the work today, encourage them. For those that are fatigued and fearful, strengthen them. For those that are wondering, is it worth it? May they by faith completely sell out to you. May they give their lives to follow you. Don't be, don't be discouraged in the work of God. Give yourself to Jesus and be encouraged in what God's trying to do.